from both sides of the fence. It's about you at home as well. I love to read out all of your comments, or at least as many as I can. So join me, Michelle Jubry, Monday to Friday, 6 till 7 on Jubes & Co. On radio, they call it the drive time slot, 4 p.m. until 6 p.m. as listeners head home. It's that part of the schedule when the dust of the day's events begin to clarify, and we try to make sense of it for you. Brazier is drive time for radio and TV. It's fast, it's punchy, it's opinionated, there's a brazier angle and a little bit of levity. That's the question. That's two questions, actually. <laughs> That's Brazier, Monday to Thursday, 4 till 6 on GB News. Hello, I'm Patrick Christie's. And I'm Mercy Moroki. Make sure that you join us Monday to Thursday, 10 a.m. until midday, right here on GB News for To The Point. We're not afraid to talk about the topics that matter to you or the big topics that always matter. We cover absolutely everything from the breaking political stories of the day to law and order, what's going on in the channel. We're not afraid to hold people to account. We always make sure we include your views on our show. Indeed, if you're thinking it, you can guarantee that we're saying it. So make sure you join the conversation with us 10 a.m. until midday, Monday to Thursday, for To The Point on GB News. I'm Dan Wilson. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wilson tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. And welcome to this bank holiday edition of On The Money, where we're focused on the UK's cost of living crisis, helping you beat the squeeze. I'm Liam Halligan. For the next hour, we'll be talking about food prices. Because Bank Holiday Monday, the sun's shining across most of the UK, it's meant to be a time to be happy and relax. But for many millions of us, concerns about making ends meet are nagging. And now, one of the UK's most experienced retailers has warned that food prices, which have been spiralling upward, are set to rise even more. What should the government do to help us make ends meet? What should it do? We'll be hosting a detailed discussion, as ever, on The Money, after the GB News headlines with Rosie Wright. Good afternoon, it's one o'clock. I'm Rosie Wright, here to keep you up to date. The Labour leader, Sir Keir Starmer, says the government is not making a real difference on migrant crossings. At least 180 people on six small boats have been intercepted by border force in the English Channel this morning. Yesterday, the Ministry of Defence confirmed that 254 people arrived in seven small boats on Sunday. That follows 11 days without crossings, with strong winds and choppy seas believed to have been a factor. Sir Keir says an international coordinated criminal response is needed worked on international uh, criminal organisations before when I was director of public prosecutions. I know what can be done if you've got teams working together across Europe all the way along those routes, absolutely bearing down on these criminal gangs and working very closely with the French authorities as well. In Ukraine, Mariupol officials say Russia resumed shelling the besieged steelwork plant as soon as buses carrying civilians fleeing had left. President Zelensky says around 100 civilians were evacuated from the site on Sunday. Footage shows them emerging from the plant's rubble and being led to waiting coaches. Well, one resident of Maripol, Natalia, says she had to hide in a nearby basement during the shelling of the steel plant. We lived in the basement starting from the 27th of February. We didn't leave because our house is in close proximity with Azovstal. The whole time we were shelled with mines and then airstrikes started. Our house is completely destroyed. We have a two-storey building. It's not there anymore. It burned to the ground. The UK's Ministry of Defence says it's likely more than a quarter of Russia's battalion tactical groups in Ukraine are now combat ineffective. UK intelligence says it will probably take years for Russia to reconstitute these forces. Conservative MP Crispin Blunt has announced that he'll stand down at the next election. Last month, the former Justice Minister apologised for causing significant upset and concern after he tweeted to show support for an MP who was found guilty of sexually assaulting a 15-year-old boy. Blunt originally claimed the MP, Imran Ahmed Khan, was the victim of a dreadful miscarriage of justice before issuing an apology. 
A senior Conservative is rejecting calls to introduce an all-woman shortlist to replace the former MP Neil Parrish. Parrish sparked a by-election in his Tiverton and Honiton constituency after he resigned after admitting watching porn in the Commons. Some Conservatives had suggested that a female candidate should replace him. The Minister for Higher and Further Education, Michelle Donnellan, told GB News imposing arbitrary quotas does not do women any favours. I find quotas demeaning to women. Women can certainly get there on their own merit. We've seen that with two female prime ministers in my own party. We have a home secretary who's female, a foreign secretary who's female. What we need to be doing is encouraging women to come forward to stand, removing the barriers. A record 2.7 million people have been referred for cancer checks over the last year. NHS data shows the number of patients receiving cancer treatment has risen by 2,000 since the start of the pandemic. The NHS says it's expanded its services diagnostic capabilities with one-stop shops for tests and mobile clinics. The director of the Barts Cancer Centre, Tom Powles, told us that the NHS needs more staff. Cancer remains our number one killer will be in the future, and now we have this huge healthcare problem. Do we have the resource to deal with it, which is your question? The human resource we probably don't have right now. The Prime Minister is considering giving housing association tenants the right to buy. The Telegraph is reporting that Boris Johnson has asked officials to draw up plans to help young people struggling to get onto the property ladder in England. Freddie Poser of the campaign group Priced Out says the government simply needs to build more homes wouldn't help solve the housing crisis. The housing crisis is fundamentally one of supply. Um, we need to find a world where we're building enough houses, um, playing around with things like right to buy for housing associations will simply mean that there's less social and affordable rent properties available in five years, assuming we don't build them. New research warns that delays in passport processing could cost over a billion pounds in cancelled trips this summer. Research from the Centre for Economics and Business estimates there's currently a 50% probability of people having a successful and timely passport renewal. The passport office is advising to apply 10 weeks in advance because of the delays. You're up to date on GB News. I'll bring you more as it happens. Now let's head back to Liam for On The Money. And coming up on The Money today, the ASDA chairman, Lord Stuart Rose, has warned food prices are going up and are likely to stay elevated. Plus, chicken, traditionally a cheaper form of protein, could soon be as expensive as beef. Food prices are soaring, seriously aggravating our cost of living crisis. What can you do to make ends meet? And what can and should the government do? To help us through this cost of living squeeze, we'll be holding a detailed discussion. Plus, with today marking the 40th anniversary of the controversial sinking of a key Argentinian warship during the Falklands War, the Belgrano, we hear from one of the British commanders who says he stands by the decision to attack the Argentinian vessel. And On The Money regularly features an in-depth Startup Britain interview with a new British company. Well, today we're talking to Zainab Ardashir of Pill Sorted. She's the woman looking to upend the traditional pharmacy business, revolutionising how we get our medicines delivered. That's later in the show. And as ever, I want your questions, opinions, ideas. What do you think of the issues raised in today's On The Money and how do they impact you? Email gbviews at gbnews.uk or tweet at gbnews. And don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel. I'll read out some of your messages later in the show, so stay with us. This is GB News. I'm Liam Halligan, and you're on the money. Now, even before the war in Ukraine, UK inflation was at a 30-year high. As we emerged from lockdown last summer, demand surged, but global supply chains remained broken, pushing prices up. Then, at the end of February, Russia invaded Ukraine, of course, sending fuel and food prices into overdrive. World food prices jumped nearly 13 per cent in March alone. That's according to the Food and Agricultural Organization's price index. And that was in large part due to this Russia-Ukraine conflict. Both countries are, of course, major producers of wheat and other crops, millions of tonnes of which are shipped out via the Black Sea to the south of Ukraine, now mired in conflict. 
Many leading sea freight lines anyway refuse now to handle goods originating from Russia. With global food prices spiralling upward, attention's turning to UK production. But prices for the fuel and fertiliser that farmers need are also soaring, making homegrown food more expensive as well. We're suffering serious agricultural inflation. That's that's from the National Farmers Union. And they're not kidding. The cost of UK farmers' imports, including fuel and fertiliser, are up around 30% on a year ago. And that, of course, feeds into the price of food in the shops. Supermarkets like Asda are indeed acknowledging that food prices, up 5.9% over the last year on official data, are set to rise more. As the chairman Stuart Rose, a Tory peer, is warning high food prices will be with us for a while. Food prices will go higher and stay high for quite some time, I fear, said Lord Rose this weekend. It's going to be very hard, he continued, and I see no quick solution to this. Stuart Rose used to run Argos and then Marks and Spencers. He's a very, very experienced retailer and he's demanding the government do more to help ease the cost of living crisis, while stressing that Asga has dropped and locked his quotes, the price of many necessities. Stuart Morell's chief executive of Co-op has also weighed in. He's warned that chicken could soon cost as much as beef, given the rising price of wheat and barley used to make chicken feed, and given the huge disruption to chicken exports from where, yes, you've guessed it, Ukraine. It's bank holiday Monday, the sun's shining. We're meant to be happy. But many millions of us will have nagging concerns about making ends meet. So that's our On The Money question today. What can the government do to tackle spiralling food prices? As ever here on The Money, grown-up conversations with people who really know their stuff. Welsh farmer Gareth Wynne-Jones makes his return to the show. Gareth, great to have you with us. Thanks for joining us on Bank Holding Monday. Ali Bilton also joins us again. She's the Yorkshire-based and founder of the frozen, frozen food company, Ali Bilton Cooks. Great to have you back as well, Ali. We also have Cyrus Toddywala. He's a chef and he's the owner of Spice Cafe in Hackney, East London, great to have you with us too. Vicky Price is in the studio. She, of course, used to help run the government's economic service and now she's the chief economist at the Centre for Economic and Business Research. A fabulous panel. Gareth Wynne-Jones, let's start with you. We've talked a lot in recent weeks, you and I, haven't we, about food prices. No surprise to you then what Lord Stuart Rose, the boss of Asda, is now saying. Well, we've been saying this for a long time, and we, Liam, you know, um, and it's just the tip of the iceberg. It's scary times ahead of us. And, you know, ag inflation is running at 28.8% in this country, um, which is a really scary uh, stat. We need a farming food revolution in this country, and government needs to stand up now and start thinking how to secure the food that we're producing in the UK and we have to do this together. It's an all around um, proposition. It has to be the big retailers, it has to be, you know, the small butcher shops, it has to be the farmer, you know, because the, these food prices are gonna go higher and it's gonna be a struggle for people. We've got energy, um, inflation, everything's hitting these people. And we wanna be producing food at an affordable price for you know the majority of the people in this country. And we can't do it with our rising costs, the rising costs um, for feed, you know, as Steve Morell says, and he's dead right with the chickens, they could be as expensive as beef. And um, you know, wh- where do we go from that scenario? Because that's a massive, um, amount of protein that's feeding people affordably. Let's not forget that, you know, we, we can have our grass fed like we've got lamb and beef, which is fine. But it, again, you know, we have to produce it affordably for the masses. That's our job. And to do it in, in a regenerative, environmentally and sustainable way. So massive challenges, but food security and the government needs to step in ASAP before we sleepwalk into food shortages, like I've been saying for the last six months, and not many people have been listening on mainstream media except for GB News, fair play. That's kind of you, Gareth, though. It doesn't get the baby iron, does it, as my mum 
would say it doesn't help anybody. At least the media is now starting to wake up. Ali Bilton, great to have you back on the show. You, you have appeared as uh, one of my Money Talks guests in the past. So you are a chef. You run a company producing frozen food. Ali Bilton cooks. What do you think of the fact that the big food retailers, Stuart Rose, a major, major figure, the guy runs Asda, he used to run Argos, used to run m &S. He is now warning of what's happening. He said that his food, his supermarket, very much a discount supermarket, is dropping and locking the price of those necessities. But in fairness to him, it takes something, doesn't it, for a retailer to put their head above the parapet and say food prices are going up and they're staying up. Yeah, it is. Uh, it's a very difficult situation for all of us. Um, I've noticed over the last week or so, or the last month, uh, particularly, I was just saying the cost of chicken. We do quite a few chicken dishes here, and uh, just recently gone up hugely. Um, I mean, we work. Well, I work six, seven days a week now, and I'm looking at perhaps uh, the cost of value-added meats like uh, chicken fillets or duck fillets and things like that. I'm thinking of, you know, perhaps buying the whole thing because obviously the cost of labor is is causing the price of the, that sort of thing to go up. So perhaps I buy in the whole chicken and I factor in the cost of doing it myself, of boning the chicken out. But then that's the cost of my labor. And is it worth doing that? But um, what we try to do here is to cook as seasonally as possible and uh, to use as many local suppliers and producers as possible so we have very few food miles i bought an electric van fortunately i bought it last year with the sort of view of doing a um you know more environmentally friendly but in fact that's been a big useful investment for me because we can deliver much cheaper which we do to people and so that i'm factoring in that into my price that i can deliver much cheaper so I have to, so, but I'm still not making as much money on the food as I was before. So, um, but because we cook seasonally and we cook frozen food, I can lock in the price at the time. And then, uh, you know, I sort of, then I have to think about it a little bit further down the line, which obviously is going to become a bigger problem. But people can buy from me now at a fixed price. And then I can maybe have to lock that in, think about that when I cook the same dish again. So they mm. can buy things from me now that will last for six months. Mm. And so that is a saving in itself, possibly, hopefully, that people will look at it in that respect. Very interesting. Yeah, your, your customers can buy food now. Free. It's obviously frozen. That's your model. And then yes. that can maybe, in a way, hedge against those rising prices going forward, depending on the size of their freezer. Cyrus Todewala, Ali Bilton, who we just heard from in Yorkshire, is in a competitive business. So are you in Hackney in East London, a part of the capital I know well. You're the chef and owner of Spice Cafe. A lot of people, they'll like to go out and have, you know, a nice meal, maybe at the yep. weekend. Are you seeing that the prices of the food that you buy means that you're having to raise your prices? Is yet that yet affecting your footfall, the number of people who are turning up? That is the greatest challenge we've got, Liam, at the moment, because food prices are fluctuating every single day. It's not that we can actually fix anything. These days, we cannot even fix a, a periodical contract for some of the products that we buy because prices are going up all the time. Letters are flowing in every week from different suppliers. And um, uh, it's becoming very difficult to try and maintain a certain margin on a menu without actually now having to put the prices up again. But we don't know where this will end because there is no clear indication as to how much this inflation is going to continue. Because along with that, we have uh, the rise in power, uh, cost of power, cost of gas, cost of electricity, everything is going up at the same time. And unfortunately, eventually, the poor customer will have to pay more money, which means that there is a chance that restaurants will now start to really suffer. And maybe people may go out much less than they used to because of the fear of rising costs. And I think it will have a knock-on effect across the entire industry, which is struggling to survive post-pandemic. As it is, we have huge costs to refer to. And uh, over, the, over and above that, with the rising costs of raw materials, 
Oil, for example, has gone up nearly 15 pounds for a 20 liter drum. So Cooking that oil. alone Cooking oil. is a yeah. massive impact. Yeah. Cyrus, hold that thought. Vicky, briefly to you, we're going to go to the break. We're going to carry on after the break with this discussion. And what a, you know, we've just heard there from a farmer, from a, a food uh, dispatch wholesaler, if you like, from a, from a restaurant owner. We're seeing there, aren't we, in what those three frontline business people have said, what inflation does. It doesn't just raise the cost of living. It starts to drill down into business confidence. It starts to curtail investment. It starts to strangle growth. Oh, absolutely, and we need to worry about that very significantly. But it's interesting, we've just been hearing uh, w what customers might do in the future, those who buy the food from supermarkets or maybe frozen already, and those who perhaps may not be going out as much in the future. But it's quite interesting when you look at the latest retail data, and one of the reasons why I think Stuart Rose is quite concerned about keeping prices quite low, is that people have shifted their spending. And the interesting mm. thing is they've shifted the spending the other way around than what we expected. So far, anyway, maybe it's the better weather or whatever, they're buying less from supermarkets yeah. and going out more to restaurants. Yeah. So for the moment, I think various companies that have, you know, restaurant facilities or in the hospitality sector seem to be doing those okay. figures are they are a, a month away they they're, are, they're yeah. a, a month lagged aren't they absolutely so, so now maybe we're gonna see, yeah yeah now we're going to start seeing sort of prices really going up and there is some stockpiling going on and yeah. people are going and buying that cheap chicken but one newspaper report today is suggesting that and i can check it since there is a Marx and spencer opposite where we are now yeah on the way out i'll look at it, it, it they say that free range chicken per kilogram is exactly the same price it Ed Marks and Spencer as free range British rum steak. Unbelievable. So this is unbelievable. And chicken is traditionally a much cheaper form of protein because it costs usually less to produce, but the chicken feed prices are going through the roof because wheat and barley that is used to create chicken feed, the prices of those are going through the roof and it goes back to Russia and Ukraine. This is an interesting discussion because this is On The Money with me, Liam Halligan, on GB News TV, DAB Plus Digital and online. After the break, we'll keep this discussion going with my expert panel. Your emails are flooding in thick and fast. We'll read out some of those soon. Stay with us. You're on the money. Hello, I'm Michelle Jubery, and you can join me every weekday, six till seven on Jubes and Kerr. Me and my panel will get stuck right into the day's events. And I can tell you, in fact, I can warn you, expect some robust debates some strong opinions and perspectives from both sides of the fence. It's about you at home as well. I love to read out all of your comments or at least as many as I can. So join me, Michelle Jubery, Monday to Friday, six till seven on Jubes and Kerr. On radio, they call it the drive time slot, 4 p.m. until 6 p.m. as listeners head home. It's that part of the schedule when the dust of the day's events begin to clarify, and we try to make sense of it for you. Brazier is drive time for radio and TV. It's fast, it's punchy, it's opinionated, there's a brazier angle and a little bit of levity. That's the question. That's two questions, actually. <laughs> That's Brazier, Monday to Thursday, 4 till 6, on GB News. Hello, I'm Patrick Christie's. And I'm Mercy Moroki. Make sure that you join us Monday to Thursday, 10am until midday, right here on GB News for To The Point. We're not afraid to talk about the topics that matter to you or the big topics that always matter. We cover absolutely everything from the breaking political stories of the day to law and order, what's going on in the channel. We're not afraid to hold people to account. We always make sure we include your views on our show. Indeed, if you're thinking it, you can guarantee that we're saying it. So make sure you join the conversation with us 10am until midday, Monday to Thursday for To The Point on GB News. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV, where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Welcome back, you're on The Money, and we're discussing what can the government do to tackle the spiralling cost of food. This, as Lord Stuart Rose, retailing legend, the boss of Asda, no less, is warning that food prices are going to get higher and they're going to stay there. 
As ever here on The Money, we have an expert panel. We've been talking to Gareth Wynne-Jones, a farmer in Wales. We've been talking to Ali Bilton. She's based in Yorkshire. She runs the frozen food company, Ali Bilton Cooks. We've also been talking to Cyrus Tod Todawala, cafe, owner, cafe and owner, chef and owner of Spice Cafe in Hackney. I'm going to turn back to Vicky Price. Vicky used to be a very senior civil servant. You were one of the most important economists in Whitehall. So what can the government do? This is getting really serious. Well, there is a problem. If food prices are going up because of international reasons, like, for example, we don't have enough feedstock for growing whatever it is that we want to, you know, for, for our farms, uh, for chickens and so on. Plus, of course, we've got a serious problem in terms of fertilisers right now. So much of it comes up. from Russia and Belarus. So much, and prices are going half the, up. Half the fertiliser in the world, right? So what exactly do you do? And the danger is that farmers are simply not going to plant anything for next year. So they may have enough for this year, but certainly not for next year. So it's going to be a continuous problem. And so what Stuart Rose said earlier, who, who now is chair of ASDA, was that prices will stay high, and they will stay high for that reason, and they could even go higher if we don't have enough supply. So that's one of the problems. So what can the government do if those prices are rising? Yes, of course, we can look at self-sufficiency a bit more. But we do know that wheat, where we are self-sufficient, uh, is priced internationally. So yeah. prices aren't necessarily going to yeah. come down. Simply and our wheat farmers are buying fertiliser on international markets. The price absolutely. of it's absolutely spiralled. I'm going to put that to Gareth. Gareth Wynne-Jones, I live in the east of England, as we've discussed in the past. I talk to lots of farmers in my locality. They're telling me the price of fertiliser, 200 quid a tonne last year, £1,000 plus a tonne this year. They're telling me it's coming off a little bit, but it's still four times higher than this time last year. Does that mean that farmers are planting less? Does that mean that with less fertiliser, the land that they do plant will produce less? Does that mean that these high food prices, as Stuart Rose is warning, are basically locked in for at least a year? Yeah, what people forget is, um, you know, the primary producer here is the farmer all the time. And, um, you know, this has hit us quite a few months ago. The doubling in diesel, you know, red diesel's gone from 50 pence up to a pound. You know, you've said about the fertilizer, the feed cost has gone astronomical. And what a lot of farmers have done and will be doing is they're turning the food tap, okay? So we'll be producing a little bit less. I could take you to many farms in this area where, you know, they're cutting down on stock, they're putting less fertiliser, so they'll have less grass to feed less stock for next year. And it's the same across the board, you know, the guys that are milking, they'll be the same. You know, the pig boys are, are getting hit really, really hard. So, and Gareth, let me put this to you, if I may. Gareth, let me put this to you, if I may. You're planting less because farmers can't afford to literally bet the ranch, right? Because the fuel to lay the fertiliser, because the fertiliser itself is more expensive, because the finance they may need to pay for this stuff, the rate of interest they'll be paying on that finance will be going up as well. The three Fs of farming that you and I have spoken yeah. about, right? Fuel, fertiliser, finance. With some kind of yeah. government support, could that production be bolstered? It sounds like a return to the European Union or something, doesn't it? Except you'll be paid to plant rather than paid to not plant. It, it's a slow process, isn't it? You know, when you're putting that seed in the ground, you know, six, eight, ten months for it to, to, to you know, um, sow and then start um, reaping the rewards of that. And, it, you know, it's 28 months for me to have a calf and then to produce um, beef at the end of it. You know, nine months for a lamb. So the, these are long processes. You know, we're the only businesses that are producing something and not knowing what we're going to get at the end of the day. And I really feel, I really feel for the consumer and the customer because, you know, supermarkets are still making a profit, are still making massive profits. We've seen that on Tesco's. You know, we've got two small businesses with me sitting here which are really struggling because this is the difference. We want to be making sure we've got food security, Liam, in this country, and it has to be government driven. We have to have a farming food revolution here. And, you know, we, has, we have definitely have to waste less food. And we have to have stop having two for the price of one in supermarkets as well. So we, we really appreciate more about food. But that food tap is being shut down. And I am telling you, we are sleepwalking into food shortages unless we start to, you know, really tell government 
we need to do something. They need to start to pull their fingers out and start listening to people that are on the ground, working the soil, trying to produce food at an affordable rate for the consumer. Ali Bilton, let's bring you in. You're based up in Yorkshire. I remember from meeting you, you're, you know, you're the embodiment of an entrepreneur. You've, you, you've turned your chef experience into a, a successful frozen food company, Ali Bilton Cooks. You don't strike me as the kind of person who looks to other people to solve your problems, but do you think there should be more government intervention? I think there is a certain element of that. Yes, we do need help. I mean, um, these price rises are just ridiculous now. I mean, it's there are, as everyone says, there are so many factors involved that it's, it's so complex, um, but a lot of it is government related as well. And they need to sort of, to have some kind of intervention to help us. To, um, to bring the prices back to some kind of normality, because as Cyrus was saying, we have exactly the same thing. Every time I get uh, an invoice in from one of my suppliers, we put it into our uh, costing and um, our software to, to see what the difference is. And each time, every single time we make it, it's going up by about 10%. So it is very difficult to, uh, to plan forward and to, to try and stop the, uh, for us to have to increase our prices, we do everything that we possibly can to reduce. Like I was saying, we use an electric van. I walked to my butcher's, he's two doors down from here. Um, we walk my greengrocer, we, uh, I don't have any deliveries, we get everything through mm -hmm. our electric van so that we save costs in that respect. Um, so the fuel, that element hasn't um, affected me that much, but yes, we do need help for sure. Cyrus, let's go back to you. I apologise. You've moved your restaurant. It's uh, Cafe Spice Namaste at Royal Albert Wharf. I apologise for yep. that oversight. To what extent are you trying to cut costs while still producing a quality product, a quality dining experience for your customers at a reasonable price? Uh, unfortunately, we are in the business of uh, uh, supplying a high-end high product. And for us to try and cut costs is very, very difficult because over the last 26 years of the life of Cafe Spice Namaste, people have come to expect a high standard of food from us. And because my suppliers are uh, dotted in different parts of the country, uh, for most of our meat comes organic, most of our chicken we only buy free-range British chicken. And the costs have constantly now in the last couple of months seen a escalation. So we are trying to find this in between. So I take a couple of items off the menu if I have to. Seafood prices are going up. Again, that is a problem. But then small business like businesses like us, we get slammed with more national insurance. We've got pensions to pay. Business got, rights. You know, business rates are oh. crippling in Newham at the moment. And um, it is becoming very difficult for us to cohesively manage. So maybe look at more cheaper food options, but still maintain the quality and not to substitute for the raw materials that we produce, because that will be detrimental to my business completely. I cannot afford to lose that reputation. But at the same time, we have to see that the customers' demands are also changing all the time. Yes, I'm glad that vegetarianism is slightly on the rise, veganism <laughs> is rising. So, you know, in on one sense, you can cope with that. But on the other sense, it's very, very difficult to make ends meet at the moment. And for a small business, it is actually come to a stage where we are constantly thinking, do we cut manpower? How do you cut manpower? Somebody's livelihood, you cannot take it away from them. And so there are all sorts of issues that are facing us at the moment. Hold that thought, Cyrus. Vicky, what do you think is going to happen here? You and I said after the spring statement back in um, March, didn't we, that this was going to be an issue, that there wasn't nearly enough support for ordinary people with the cost of living. Uh, these utility bills that everyone's suffering from, 54% up, that increase was decided in February before Russia-Ukraine impacted wholesale energy prices. There's surely going to have to be some kind of emergency budget this summer, isn't there? I think so, but I mean, the Chancellor would hope they can wait until October, which is you know the next time you could m make any real serious statement. But we saw through COVID that there were so many emergency budgets, lots of mm. announcements, and actually even before the budget, um, this time round in spring, we saw a number of, or in late winter, we saw 
a number of announcements already made before it. So there is nothing to say that we're not going to get something more, and I mm. think we will. There's so much pressure now. The benefits increase hasn't been sufficient, really, and that's a, that's a problem way um, behind uh, the inflation that we're seeing at present. And, and really making up for it, uh, you know, we need to move into this quite quickly because it is the people at the lower end of the pay scale who spend most of the food on most of the money on food and fuel, and they are the ones that are hit worse. Here's a prediction with the likes of Stuart Rose, a major British retailer, saying what he said over the weekend that we've highlighted today. I expect something, some kind of it, even if it's a gimmick, before the local elections in Thursday. But we shall see. We'll be discussing this many, many more times. Vicky Price, Chief Economist of the Centre for Economic and Business Research, thank you so much for being here with us. Thank you, Ali Bilton of Ali Bilton Cook, Cyrus Todiwala of Cafe Spice, Namaste at Royal Albert Wharf in East London, and, of course, Gareth Wynne-Jones, World's Beef Farmer. All friends of the show, all part of this panel that we brought you here today on The Money, because that's what we do. And coming up, it's Startup Britain, interview with Zainab Ardashir. She is co-founder and CEO of Pill Sorted. That's the company which believes the typical pharmacy experience has long in been need of an upgrade with pharmacists facing high demand and manual repetitive tasks. We'll be talking to her after the GB News headlines with Rosie Wright. It's 1.34. Good afternoon. I'm Rosie Wright, keeping you up to date on GB News. At least 300 people have been intercepted on up to nine small boats in the English Channel so far today. Over 250 people arrived in seven small boats on Sunday. The Labour leader, Sir Keir Starmer, has denied he broke COVID-19 lockdown rules while in Durham in April last year. Uh, there was no party, there was no breach of the rules, and there's nothing really to add to that. Contrast that with Downing Street, where we know there have been 50 fines issued already in Downing Street in relation to goings on in Downing Street. I think that makes Downing Street the most fined workplace in the whole of the United Kingdom already, and criminal investigations are going on. In Ukraine, Mariupol officials say Russia resumed shelling the besieged steel plant in the city as soon as buses carrying civilians had left. Footage shows people emerging from the plant's rubble and waiting to be led to coaches. One woman said she and her baby had been waiting for two months to be rescued. A record 2.7 million people have been referred for cancer checks over the last year. NHS data shows the number of patients receiving cancer treatment has risen by 2,000 since the start of the pandemic. Conservative MP Crispin Blunt has announced that he'll stand down at the next election. Last month, the former Justice Minister apologised after he tweeted in support of an MP who was found guilty of sexually assaulting a 15-year-old boy. Well, Blunt originally claimed the MP, Imrad Ahmed Khan, was the victim of a dreadful miscarriage of justice before then issuing an apology. You're up to date on GB News, we're on your TV, online and DAB Plus Radio. Liam will be back shortly with On The Money. Looking ahead to today's weather, and the UK is looking rather cloudy to start with some fog. It'll turn brighter, but also showery. Let's get the details. Starting off in the southwest, and this morning's cloud is set to linger until lunchtime for many, with a few spots of drizzly rain, feeling markedly warmer than yesterday, though. It's also looking mostly cloudy across much of the southeast and around London. It'll be mostly dry, and any early fog should have cleared. It's a different story for Wales. Here the cloud is going to break up, allowing for some sunny breaks, but also a scattering of showers. It's looking similar across many parts of the West Midlands. It'll be brightest for more northern parts, with more showers here. Meanwhile, further south, the cloud is set to linger. Coastal parts of northeast England may have some lingering fog as we head through lunchtime and into this afternoon. Inland, things will be brighter, but a greater chance of some showers developing too. Whilst northern areas of Scotland are looking mostly fine with some lengthy bright periods, it will be more showery for central and southern parts, though still some sunny spells. There'll also be a mixture of sunny spells and scattered showers across Northern Ireland. Here, temperatures are set to reach highs of around 15 Celsius. There'll be further showers as we head through the afternoon, with the cloud in the south breaking up. And that's how the weather is shaping up for the rest of the day.
Hello, I'm Michelle Jubri, and you can join me every weekday, 6 till 7, on Jubes and Kerr. Me and my panel will get stuck right into the day's events, and I can tell you, in fact, I can warn you, expect some robust debate, some strong opinions, and perspectives from both sides of the fence. It's about you at home as well. I love to read out all of your comments, or at least as many as I can. So join me, Michelle Jubri, Monday to Friday, 6 till 7, on Jubes and Kerr. On radio, they call it the drive time slot, 4 p.m. until 6 p.m. as listeners head home. It's that part of the schedule when the dust of the day's events begin to clarify, and we try to make sense of it for you. Brazier is drive time for radio and TV. It's fast, it's punchy, it's opinionated, there's a brazier angle and a little bit of levity. That's the question. That's two questions, actually. <laughs> That's Brazier, Monday to Thursday, 4 till 6, on GB News. Hello, I'm Patrick Christie's. And I'm Mercy Moroki. Make sure that you join us Monday to Thursday, 10 a.m. until midday, right here on GB News for To The Point. We're not afraid to talk about the topics that matter to you or the big topics that always matter. We cover absolutely everything from the breaking political stories of the day to law and order, what's going on in the channel. We're not afraid to hold people to account. We always make sure we include your views on our show. Indeed, if you're thinking it, you can guarantee that we're saying it. So make sure you join the conversation with us 10 a.m. until midday, Monday to Thursday, for To The Point on GB News. I'm Dan Wilson. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wilson tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Welcome back, you're on The Money. Now, today marks the 40th anniversary of the sinking of the General Belgrano by the British nuclear-powered submarine HMS Conqueror, with the loss of 323 lives. It proved to be the most controversial moment in the 1981's Falkland War, as our home and security editor, Mark White, has been finding out. There was a cheer as we heard the explosion and a captain reported from the periscope seeing it because we had done what our government tasked us to do, and we were very professional about it. it. Followed almost instantaneously with absolute silence, and as everyone had their own thoughts, thinking there were over a thousand sailors on board the Belgrano, and they were doing what their government tasked them to do. It's 40 years since Vice Admiral Sir Tim McClement was a young Lieutenant Commander in the Royal Navy, second in command of the submarine HMS Conqueror, as it shadowed and then fired on the Argentinian cruiser General Belgrano. It was one of the most controversial episodes in the Falklands War, with claims that Belgrano was sailing away from a 200-mile UK-imposed exclusion zone around the islands. But Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher agreed with her senior military commanders that the Belgrano posed a direct threat to the Royal Navy Task Force heading for the South Atlantic. Um, Admiral Woodward had two carriers and not very many Harriers, and the Argentinians had uh, over 200 aircraft, so we had to protect our carriers, because if we lost one, then that would be the end of our ability to retake the islands. And at the time, on the beginning of May, Admiral Woodward believed there was a pincer movement with the Argentinian aircraft carrier to the northwest of the islands, coming with his escorting destroyers, and to the southwest of the islands, the Belgrano group with two, two destroyers as well. The Belgrano, which began life as the American light cruiser USS Phoenix, had survived Japan's attack on Pearl Harbor, only to succumb to two Royal Navy torpedoes. 323 Argentinians died on board the Belgrano. This notorious Sun headline at the time was later toned down as the extent of the loss of life became apparent. It was the big turning point. They knew from that moment, I can remember being told, I was with the troops in the Canberra at the time that this had happened. And uh, within two days, of course, the Sheffield was uh, sunk. And everybody in charge knew there was going to be a real war. Whatever talks might or might not happen, there was going to be a real war. And they realised there were still going to be problems, big problems. 
Safeguarding the Royal Navy Task Force was at the heart of the decision to sink the Belgrano. Vice Admiral McClement says the actions of those on board HMS Conqueror were fully justified. One regrets loss of life in war. Galtieri had invaded the islands. He needed to be evicted and you use brutal force to try and shorten the war as quickly as possible so that you succeed. The Belgrano was a threat, needed to be taken out and we did it. There's no doubt the sinking of the Belgrano was a decisive moment in the Falklands conflict as the Argentinian Navy retreated to port and played no further part in the war. Mark White, GB News. Mark White reporting there. It's time now for my regular feature, Startup Britain, in which we showcase some of the UK's most successful and interesting new companies. And today I'm talking to Zainab Ardashir. She's the CEO and co-founder of Pill Sorted. Since the easing of COVID-19 regulations, pharmacies have been extremely busy as customers demand medications and prescriptions. While some new pharmacies opened last year, almost twice as many closed. So we ended the year with 215 fewer than we had before across the UK. And that's according to NHS data. And in the pharmacies we do have left, queues are rife and processes can be slow, with the basic dispensing model having remained pretty much the same for more than a century. Zainab Ardashir founded Pill Sorted in 2019 to challenge the way we currently receive our medicines. Her model, she says, provides a simple, personalised service with medicine delivered straight to your door. And here she is in the studio, Zainab Ardashir, co-founder of Pill Sorted. She is my latest guest on Startup Britain. Zainab, great to have you here on the show. You're more than welcome here on The Money. Thank you. Hi, Liam. And may I say happy Eid to your viewers at home? Certainly may. Now, you are a pharmacist by background, and yet you are also an entrepreneur. Yes. What made you just leave a sort of regular job where I assume you were employed to do something as, as courageous, as potentially um, tumultuous as upending this model of pharmacy that we've had for over a century? Absolutely. So uh, I've been a pharmacist for the past 17 years. And the best parts of my day are when I'm listening to my patients and I'm helping them understand the science behind the medications and supporting them live healthier, happier lives. Any time that I spent on manual repetitive tasks, I felt at a loss. And there's a lot of them because pharmacy as an industry needs uh, modernization. The infrastructure is based on a 200-year-old legacy system of paper prescriptions. Mm. That's why I set up... With the up famous the... doctor's scrawly handwriting <laughs> that only you can read. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> the pro properly, the properly needs decoding, actually. Yeah. So I set up Pill Sorted as a new model of pharmacy, ones that care first but fully enabled by technology. We deliver people's me uh, medication because that's what they want. We deliver their repeats on time, making sure they never run out of the medicine. We deliver the acutes on demand as well. And we upgrade the care. They can counsel their pharmacists, other healthcare professionals from the privacy and comfort of their own homes. So let me ask how it works. I go to the doctor if I can get an appointment. Yeah. Can't tell you how many emails I've had from people who can't get a doctor's appointment these days. Or I'm able to renew a prescription, an existing prescription, uh, with a face, with a with a, um, a, a phone consultation, which is also possible, of course. I then get that prescription. Mm -hmm. What happens? I don't get something in my hand with a scrawled piece of writing on it, and I don't then have to go to my high street in order to queue up at a pharmacist to get the drugs dispensed to me. That's where the word comes from, right? Dispensing chemist. Okay. How does your model work? And is it available on the NHS? Absolutely. So that's the beauty of NHS. NHS has connected all the GP surgeries and all the pharmacies via an electronic system, the, uh, an electronic database. So you as a patient can ask your GP surgery or ask us the pharmacist and say, I want you to be my NHS pharmacy. OK. In that way, we link it to the NHS database and say, I am this patient's NHS pharmacist. When you go to the doctor, they will write your prescription, but the prescription is electronic. It and, it, and you get copied in, as it were. Exactly. And then your, 
you, that is your instruction from the doctor because it's a secure email. Absolutely. And then you then mm -hmm. post or do you deliver by courier? Do you so, use the raw mail? How does that work? Very good point. We use our own fleet of regulated, reliable uh, drivers. Because we you, it's a bit dangerous to send drugs through the post, of course, isn't it? And in some cases, it's, <laughs> yeah, I, don't, I think it's actually against the rules, certain kinds of drugs. Um, rules have changed quite a okay. lot. If I give you a spectrum of what's out there right now, on one side we've got uh, 14, uh, 1, 000, yeah, 14,000 community pharmacies which provide the face-to-face -face personalised service. Mm, mm. On the other side we've got the online pharmacies that deliver usually via postal service actually. And there has been a lot of hit and misses of what they can deliver and what not. Right. Peel Sorted combines that personalised feeling and it keeps it consistent with the technology that we have. Yeah. And we deliver by hand delivery. So that uh, fleet of drivers that go to the patient's home can bring trust that there's a pharmacy behind it. Okay. So, and it's all integrated, yeah. So do you still have physical a physical location for the pharmacies under your model? Of course. So people can still, if they want to, because mm -hmm. for a lot of people, mm -hmm. particularly during the pandemic, mm -hmm. you guys were, were the front line, right? And I know uh, some of my friends are pharmacists. Yeah, they were working really hard because they felt the GPs weren't always there. Apologies to many, many NHS GPs who did work very, very hard. I'm talking not in general. I'm talking about emails I've had from many, many uh, viewers and listeners mm -hmm. uh, about the lack of GP face-to-face consultations. Yeah. Because for a lot of people, the high street pharmacist is still valuable as a reassuring presence, a symbol of trust and a symbol of advice. And under your model, you're not going to remove GPs from the high street, are you? No, that's... Uh, really uh, pharmacists, excuse me, from the high oh, street. Sorry. That's a brilliant point you said. There will absolutely always be a need for a walk-in centre, for yeah. people to have access to a healthcare professional without having to make an appointment. And I've been a community pharmacist for the past 13 years, and kudos to all my you know, colleagues. They've done a fantastic job, especially during COVID. Yeah, yeah. As you said, we've yeah. been there, we've been you know, passionately trying our best for the patients. So that is a need. And I... Um, um, <laughs> Credit to NHS, especially in the long-term plan, they have acknowledged this fantastic feed, uh, service that the pharmacies are mm. creating, and they are, uh, you know, changing the models to make sure there are enough services and pharmacies are getting compensated for it. In the short term, I'm focusing on the patients that actually need that delivery service and they need their medication. Because they're elderly or frail and they Absolutely. can't always get to the pharmacy, OK. Yeah. Or any other person. So a young mother whose yeah. wake-up times is different yeah. from the pharmacy shop of course, time, yeah, of course. they need that help as well. Plus upgrading and making sure that they never run out of their medications. So we make sure that we can they can have that conversation with the healthcare professional, but from the privacy and comfort of their own homes. So if people want to use your service, what do they do? Do they ask their GP? Are there other providers like you who are trying to link together mm -hmm. the NHS dispensing model? Mm -hmm. And how do you actually make money from this? Because you, you're providing an extra service. Exactly. Does the NHS pay you more to do these deliveries? Excellent question. We do not cost NHS any extra than any other pharmacy. We do not get paid extra for the delivery at all. In fact, my whole uh, aim is to save NHS money by um, um, preventing the costly hospital uh, uh, hospitalizations. Why? If a patient misses their medication, this can have dire consequences on their health and this mm. can lead to A&E trips, it can lead to hospitalisation. When there's a pharmacist that proactively takes care of their medication, helps them, supports them with the medicine management, they, will, they are more likely to have a settled condition, feel safe and feel confident, feel uh, stay independent. Mm. And this uh, saves NHS a lot of money. So we work a lot to personalise the, uh, the patient's journey. Example, I started making... Uh, no, carry, carry on. <laughs> I started making a list for uh, any patient with their medicine, okay. with the tablet, the shape of the tablet. Oh, and I see. Where to take it. Yeah. People absolutely love yeah, it. Yeah. Now I've used the technology to actually um, implement it, and it comes automatic from the dispensing data. 
And it's been a great value for a lot of patients. Well, Zainab Ardashir, you are the CEO and co-founder of Pill Sorted. Yes. It's really great to hear about some innovation going on yes. in, in the NHS at the sharp end, helping to put customers first. And we wish you all the very best. Great to have you here in Thank the studio you. with us. Zainab Ardashir there, the CEO and co-founder of Pill Sorted. She was a pharmacist, now she's in business. Before we finish the show, let's bring in some of your review views on those rising food prices. Owen says, the government should give plots of land as community allotments so we can grow our own food. I think that's a great idea, Owen. Edward contacted us to say business rates are a big expense at the moment and contribute a lot to food price increases. Maybe people should consider getting rid of their Labour councils and vote in more Conservative councils whose business rates are consistently a lot lower. Having said that, for balance, it is the Labour government, it is the Labour Party at the moment who's proposing to scrap business rates and the Conservative Party isn't as yet. But we shall see. And Paul says, Liam, I wait with braced breath for answers on what the government can do about spiralling food costs. So far, no one has come up with any solutions. We are trying. It's very, very difficult, but at least we're framing the problem and talking about these issues. Thanks for all your emails today. That's all we've got time for. Thank you for joining me. I'll be back tomorrow at 1pm. But for now, have a lovely bank holiday. This is GB News. I'm Liam Halligan, and that was your bank holiday special on the money. Looking ahead to today's weather, and the UK is looking rather cloudy to start with some fog. It'll turn brighter, but also showery. Let's get the details. Starting off in the southwest, and this morning's cloud is set to linger until lunchtime for many, with a few spots of drizzly rain, feeling markedly warmer than yesterday, though. It's also looking mostly cloudy across much of the southeast and around London. It'll be mostly dry, and any early fog should have cleared. It's a different story for Wales. Here the cloud is going to break up, allowing for some sunny breaks, but also a scattering of showers. It's looking similar across many parts of the West Midlands. It'll be brightest for more northern parts with more showers here. Meanwhile, further south, the cloud is set to linger. Coastal parts of northeast England may have some lingering fog as we head through lunchtime and into this afternoon. Inland, things will be brighter, but a greater chance of some showers developing too. Whilst northern areas of Scotland are looking mostly fine with some lengthy bright periods, it will be more showery for central and southern parts, though still some sunny spells. There'll also be a mixture of sunny spells and scattered showers across Northern Ireland. Here temperatures are set to reach highs of around 15 Celsius. There'll be further showers as we head through the afternoon, with the cloud in the south breaking up. And that's how the weather is shaping up for the rest of the day. On radio, they call it the drive time slot, 4 p.m. until 6 p.m. as listeners head home. It's that part of the schedule when the dust of the day's events begin to clarify, and we try to make sense of it for you. Brazier is drive time for radio and TV. It's fast, it's punchy, it's opinionated, there's a Brazier angle and a little bit of levity. That's the question. That's two questions, actually. <laughs> That's Brazier, Monday to Thursday, 4 till 6, on GB News. On radio, they call it the drive time slot, 4 p.m. until 6 p.m. as listeners head home. It's that part of the schedule when the dust of the day's events begin to clarify, and we try to make sense of it for you. Brazier is drive time for radio and TV. It's fast, it's punchy, it's opinionated, there's a Brazier angle and a little bit of levity. That's the question. That's two questions, actually. <laughs> That's Brazier, Monday to Thursday, 4 till 6, on GB News. Hello there, I'm Eamon Holmes. And I'm Isabel Webster. And we hope you can join us for... Breakfast with Eamon. And Isabel. You make me laugh out loud, belly laugh. Is that important first thing in the morning? Yeah, absolutely. And there's me trying to be deadly serious. <laughs> News is a serious business. Yeah, I have to rein you in sometimes. Well, it doesn't stop us laughing at it. It doesn't stop us having an opinion on what's going on. Yeah. And it certainly will not stop us reflecting what you think. Weekdays from 6 to half past 9 on GB News. Join me, Gloria De Piero, Monday to Thursday at noon for The Briefing. We go to the parts of Parliament that you won't see elsewhere. Plus, there's exclusive interviews with MPs from all parties. 
but quite often they paper over the real truth. Why does a working class lad like you join the Tories? That's a good question. Don't miss it. Monday to Thursdays at noon on GB News. Hello, I'm